One of the biggest challenges that the church faces today in clearly communicating its beliefs and its teachings is that in a post-Christian society, everyone thinks that they've already heard it. We think that we already know the story and the teachings, and so we render our judgments based on that. We've all seen renditions of The Last Supper, and we've all heard some sort of version of that narrative, and we all know that Christians have some kind of a ritual involving bread and wine, and somehow that ties back to the body and blood of Jesus, whatever that means. But how often are we able to encounter that story with a fresh lens and hear it again for the first time like those who were listening to Jesus did? On this topic of communion and what it is that Christians believe about it, it really starts with John's Gospel in chapter 6. And I want you to imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus introduce this topic for the first time. And hopefully if I have time in editing this video, I will be able to include some visuals that will make this a little bit easier for you, but if not, you're just stuck looking at me. Sorry. It starts off with this beautiful and almost poetic language about how there is a bread of God that comes down from heaven. And as somebody who's being introduced to this concept for the first time, you're probably thinking, oh, he's warming up to do one of those parables or allegories that he likes to tell. Go on then, Jesus. And so he does. He says that I am this bread of life. And if you come to me, you will never go hungry or thirsty. And then he talks a little bit more about how he is the bread of life who came down from heaven and that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Okay then, there's the allegory. Bread brings us life and Jesus is like a bread that brings us eternal life. Great. But the people that were listening to this were, were complaining a little bit because they were like, he didn't come down from heaven. We know him. He's from Nazareth. We know his parents. So Jesus pushes this narrative a little bit further. He says that you have to believe in him and that he is the bread that comes down from heaven. And then things get a little bit weirder. He says that whoever eats of this bread will have eternal life and that this bread is his flesh. And so at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, well, we're still blending a lot of symbolic language. And so maybe I just confused the metaphor or something. But if you're hoping to hold on to that, Jesus at this point turns a corner and he just blurts it out and the tone completely changes. And then he says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And if you're like most people there, you're probably thinking, well, that's, that's it for me. The miracles were cool and I was with you on the whole love your neighbor thing, but this is a bridge too far. Good luck, Jesus, with that whole feeding yourself to people. What's clear about this passage in the Bible is that Jesus' language goes from somewhat metaphorical to straight up explicitly literal. And the people that heard this understood it like that. They got super offended and they started to leave. And Jesus never stops them to clarify, to say that it's not supposed to be taken like that. He just turns to the few people that are still there and he says, are you gonna go too? Almost as if to say, cause I meant what I just said. And this is one of the most contentious topics and issues between various Christian denominations and factions. Some like Catholics and Eastern Orthodox believe that when the bread and the wine are blessed, that they substantially change into the body and blood of Jesus, but still retain the appearance of bread and wine. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are groups that say that Jesus was just giving us a ritual to reenact as a memorial of his sacrifice, and that it only symbolically represents his body and blood. And also, wine is evil, so we're just going to go with grape juice, thank you very much. And in the early phases of my own conversion to Christianity, I felt like this was a controversy that I needed to resolve to figure out where I fit in in Christ's church. And so I tried to weigh the different reasons that support both positions and everything in between. So in considering that, the questions that I thought were the most relevant were, is there any good reason to think that it's just a symbol? What did the people who were listening to Jesus actually think he meant by it? What did the early church believe? And what best fits the progressing narrative of salvation in the Bible? So looking at the first question, the support for the idea that it's merely a symbol seems to be based on the moral objection that cannibalism is clearly wrong and yucky. And so it can't be a literal thing that we're supposed to do, even if it's still under the appearance of bread and wine. And I can sympathize with that a bit. 
But where I get lost is in the idea that symbolic cannibalism is an acceptable substitute for actual cannibalism. If the literal feeding on God incarnate to sustain your life bothers you, then so should the symbol. It's the idea itself that is problematic, and whether it's literal or metaphorical, the idea still remains. Also, it's not cannibalism, because we are being fed by God, who is an eternal source of life. It doesn't take away from his life the way it would if I killed somebody I knew and then started to make a feast out of it. So on the question of what Jesus' own audience believed, I, there's no doubt about it. They were clearly offended by his very literal and graphic language and they left because of it. So that just seems like an easy point for team literal presence. On this question of what the early church believed, some people object to this because they say that it's not scripture and the writers weren't infallible, so it shouldn't bear much weight. But that's not the reason we go to those sources. The reason is to try to get an understanding of what the early church believed. And since they're the closest to that original source, that has some credibility to it. So when we do look at the writings of the church fathers, we tend to find an understanding that lines up best with Catholic or Eastern Orthodox understanding of this. In one of the earliest Christian writings on this topic, Justin Martyr, writing to the Roman emperor, says this, not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in the manner of Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. But it's also possible to find writings from the church fathers where they talk about it as a symbol. So how do we resolve that? Well, the fact is, it is a symbol in the sense that it's a sign of something deeper. It's just not merely a symbol. So a person who really believes that it becomes literally the body and blood of Jesus could talk about it using literal language and metaphorical, metaphorical language, just like Jesus did. But a person who merely believes that it's a symbol would never describe it in both ways. So when someone like St. Augustine says that Jesus is present in the form of a symbol, but then in another place says that the bread that is blessed is the body of Jesus, there's no contradiction. Lastly, on the question of which of these views best fits with the biblical narrative of salvation, I think we need to start by looking at the Old Testament tradition and how this evolved out of the practice of sacrificing animals for the forgiveness of sins. Obviously, this wasn't done in a symbolic way. An actual death had to pay for life. And in the context of the Passover meal, which is what Jesus was celebrating with his disciples at the Last Supper, you had to sacrifice an unblemished lamb and you had to eat it. And if Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist described him, then it would make sense that there's some aspect of us consuming him as part of this. So as I focus my attention on this topic and try to resolve the competing claims of the different Christian denominations, it seemed to me that the ancient Catholic and Eastern Orthodox understanding of this was much stronger. And that's what inched me much closer to eventually embracing the Catholic faith. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed that, then please consider subscribing and liking and come find me on Facebook and Twitter. It's a huge help when you do that. It helps us get these videos in front of more and more people. And a big thank you goes out to you, Catholic, for presenting these videos. And if you want to support the making of these videos, then please consider supporting my work as a digital media and marketing expert. My company, Holds With Design, specializes in branding, web and graphic design, marketing, social media, videography, and all that kind of good stuff. So if you know of a parish, a diocese, a ministry or a business that needs help in those areas, then please send them our way and I'm sure we can help them out.